Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are super excited for today's conversation with Eric Zem. Uh, he is a dairy farmer up in upstate New York, kind of close to the Vermont border. Um, he has a background in conventional farming, but as he has said, he got bit by the uh, grazing bug. So he has since transitioned his farm to, or started High Meadows of Husik, uh, which is a dairy farm, an organic dairy farm. Um, you guys have a little over 200 cows that you're milking and then um, 300 acres that you're running that's owned acres and, and more than that uh, rented acres as well. Um, so we're super excited. I don't know that we have had a lot of dairy farmers on webinar series. So we're super excited to uh, have this conversation today. And with that, I will give it over to Eric and he is gonna share his story with us. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for the team at Green Cover and uh, Kate for having me on. And uh, I always like to uh, share my story and, and uh, also learn about uh, other people's stories. So. Um, we'll, uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, here's a, here's an overview, uh, from one of our pastures looking down at, uh, at the farm. We're, uh, uh, startup operation, um, 2018. Uh, I finished, finished up college in, in 1999, graduated from Cornell, um, returned to my uh, family's operation. That's only about, uh, seven, eight miles from here, from this, this location, uh, that was located in Cambridge, New York. This is in Hoosick Falls, New York. And, uh, we rapidly expanded that, that dairy from about a hundred head, uh, over the course of 15 years to, uh, a little over 1200 head and 3000 acres. And somewhere, uh, amongst that, uh, in, in that time frame, uh, I started asking myself a lot of questions about how we were doing things and, and what we were doing and uh, started wanting to get cows um, off of concrete and uh, wanted to get back grazing. So as Kate said, I, I was bit by the grazing bug. I started grazing a lot of our young stock uh, at that operation and uh, got to where I just made a decision on that's what I, what I want to do and how I wanted to manage cattle. So I uh, took a step, uh, sideways and uh was able to uh, come across uh, this farm uh in Hoosick, uh, new york that was uh e easily certifiable and uh, organic and uh made that move and was able to secure a milk contract with uh, stony field uh stony field yogurt in london area new hampshire uh, now owned by lactalis and uh, yeah, we were uh, we were off and 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 running, um, and a and a quite a few quite a few things contributed to that decision. And I got asking questions to myself about just because because you can should you or should I, um, and that had a lot to do with with uh, you know extending extending hopefully the the longevity of our cattle by having them out on pasture and and. Uh, pesticide use, herbicide use, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it uh, came to me that uh, this was the route that that I wanted to go. So uh, if you can advance that slide, Kate, we'll go to the next one. So uh, I always say the reason uh, the reason I get out of bed in the morning is, is right here. Um, and uh, so my wife, Jamie, and myself in the center, um, she has a, a business of her own, uh, runs a equine operation specializing in equine assisted psychotherapy works with a lot of challenged uh, kids and teenagers um so she has that along with helping uh, myself on the farm as well uh cole is to the left he's uh, 17 uh interested very interested helps us on the farms and in every sport and club uh, you can imagine uh case is on the right hand side he's 13 and and uh, same, same, same follows the same suit. Uh, loves baseball and uh, and helping me on the farm. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, don't want to admit this to the, you know, to the to the school folks, but pulled them out of school, as many young uh, farm kids do, uh, to help me 
harvest crops this spring. So uh, he helps out a lot too. So they're, again, they're the reason, they're the reason I do what I do. If you want to move to the next slide. So I uh, was able to purchase this farm, 300 acres. Um, uh, as Kate mentioned, we are Hoosick, New York, Hoosick Falls, New York, right on the Vermont border, uh, southern Vermont border. So uh, we were able to uh, build a new facility here, uh, as you see in the, uh, in the background. Um, it is a, about a 230 head or stall, uh, freestall barn, and we have a swing 16 uh, dairy master parlor. So our goal is to, to milk a little over 200 cows in, in a little over two hours so that we can, uh, you know, get the cattle back out grazing and, and, and do what they need to be doing, um, as, as quick as we can, uh, built the facility, uh, with hopefully with labor efficiency in mind, um, going from the larger farms, uh, trying to track being very, uh, you know, cognizant of, of labor efficiency, but then again, uh, you know, trying to balance the economics and all of that. So uh, our latest project, uh, as you can maybe see on the left-hand side of that barn, we, we installed a solar array on top of the roof so that we could be one step closer to, to being energy independent, which is uh, one of our sustainability goals on, on the farm. Um, and you can advance to the next slide, come on. So I, I joke, uh, I, I joke to people, uh, our cows have a better view than, than a lot of the people here in our area. So this is, uh, just a, a view out of the, the backside of the freestall barn, uh, some early spring grazing. Uh, if we could have, uh, a grazing season full of, of the month of May, uh, life would be easy, but, uh, but unfortunately that's not the case as, as we're almost entering July here and, uh, trying to balance the heat and the, and the challenges of, of, of summertime. Um, uh, go on to the next slide and we can start talking about uh, what we focus on with, with grazing. Um, so here's another picture, um, uh, just our cattle out uh, grazing. Left, the very left-hand side of that, that photo is, is where uh, they were initially grazing and then kind of split down the middle. We, we try to accomplish uh, on most days multiple moves. And that just gives us a little uh, better utilization of uh, the different species of grasses and the, um, the maturity of the grasses. Um, so that's what we're uh, trying, uh, trying to, you know, to accomplish. Um, we actually entered this farm uh, 2017, 2018, and we all, all we had was a monoculture of, of orchard grass. And I thought it would take quite a few years to, to see the diversity, but uh, through multiple moves a day, good grazing practices, um, the default of not having enough uh, money in the budget, which I initially thought I would need to do some reseeding of pastures, uh, we were able to do it all with, improve our pastures all with uh, the, the basic principles uh, of, you know, of regenerative ag, organic regenerative ag and and uh, grazing, rotational grazing. So uh, we've seen a really nice uh, diversity come into our, our pastures. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a little better uh, view of, of where the cows were and, uh, a few minutes before and, or, and where we're moving them into and uh, really trying um, to get a real good trample. Uh, and this was something I didn't uh, didn't know a lot about uh, four or five years ago. It seemed uh, more like a waste um, uh, in in your simple general mindset. But uh, you know, if we can get that really good trample on the left hand side and and work in the the, the dung and the and the urine and uh, uh, keep these cows uh, eating a diverse diet, that's that's really our goal. So. Um, yeah, so this is really what I think uh, one of the keys that helped us uh, develop these diverse pastures. After we started doing this, we really saw uh, a lot of the, the clovers come in, uh, the legumes seem to really pop. And uh, as many of you probably know, 
uh, there's a lot of a lot of latent seed in the in the ground and and uh, clover stays viable for a very very long time we just had to get it uh, activated um, so yeah so that's that's what we're trying to accomplish next slide yeah and just a, a closer up a photo this is actually in a a, a young stock a heifer pasture and uh, what we've gone to uh, what we've moved to here is we're actually trying to graze uh, what would be uh, deemed as over mature forage um, uh, grasses that are uh, headed out um, so that they're actually getting a, a very uh, balanced diet. And uh, it's amazing to see the cattle um, eat the seed heads uh, and, um, you know, be able to utilize that, that grain proportion or what I would, I would classify as a grain proportion of the, of the, um, of the uh, uh, grass. Next slide. Yeah, so here's another picture. So this is this is something I wouldn't have, uh, you know, thought much about four or five years ago, um, and just uh, learning from from other uh, successful grazers in both the, the beef and the dairy side. Um, this is these are the kind of pastures that uh, that we hope to graze for our our at least our dry, our dry stock and our, our, our young stock. I'm still working on, uh, on this with the, with the milking herd and haven't quite, uh, got there, uh, uh arrived there yet, but, uh, this has proven to be, um, what I would call dynamite pasture for, for the, for these, uh, cattle that don't have the, the higher, uh, requirements, uh, like the lactating cows. So, but again, uh, we don't, uh, we are not a, we are not in a grass fed milk market, but, um, we don't feed any grain, uh, to our dry cows or our, our heifers, um, you know, through the, through the grazing season, um, wean calves still receive a little bit up to about five, six months of age. But after that, uh, we've been able to, to cut that, uh, expense right out of our, uh, program. Um, and then, uh, along, uh, we can go to the next slide and along with that, uh, uh and then, uh, you know, good utilization of, of manure onto the next. I think we got, oh, we can probably skip this one. I think this was just a video, but, uh, there we go. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's definitely was a, a, a different concept, uh, you know, for a while to, to get a hold of, but, um, it was amazing to me to, to, to see again, and what we would originally, thought as mature forages, the, the sleekness of the cattle and uh, sitting there uh, watching them uh, utilize uh, the main portions of the plant with the seed heads. Um, they just, they perform uh, very, very well. Um, and the reason I want to go back, uh, the, the one reason that uh, I wanted to make the, the switch to grazing and have definitely enjoyed the, the benefits of is I had uh, more of a, a personal ethics and, and, issue with um, some questions I was being asked on my conventional dairy from, from some consumer type folks or people that were uh, a little less educated uh, in, the, in the dairy industry. And one was uh, the life expect expectancy of cattle. And, uh, and as, you know, as dairy producers, we all know that the, the beef side is, is, is part of our business and, you know, moving cattle along. But uh, uh, I wasn't satisfied with the, you know, with the answer of, you know, of a little over four years old of the average life expectancy of, of, uh, some of our conventional dairies. And I, I know, you know, some of you may or may not be in that category, but just, you know, that's where we were with our large conventional dairy. And, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, really been fortunate now, uh, after, uh, about five and a half, six years of producing milk that, and you know, we have cows that are almost nine years old now, um, you know, that were raised on the farm and, and, uh, and came in and calved on the farm and have spent their life here that, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, a much greater average age of productivity. So that's something that I believe, uh, can help us all as an industry, um, and can be marketable for, you know, for, if you're selling your own product or, uh, if we're trying to help, uh, you know, help market the, the product that where our, our milk goes to. So, um, that's been a very rewarding uh, sector or, or part of of making this uh, making this change and and uh, seeing that 
seeing that come come through uh, full circle. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. So uh, through all that, um, in my uh, my other operation, my family operation where I was originally, I was uh, in charge uh, more so of the the cattle and the the people uh, in the milking parlor and related to the the farmstead. Uh, my brothers handled the cropping, so uh, cropping was a little bit secondary to me. Uh, even though I grew up on a small farm and we all did everything and uh, chores and hit the field, so I obviously had a, a pretty good understanding. But um, I wanted to take the same philosophy that we were uh, trying to accomplish with grazing and uh, producing milk to the field and see if we could <clears throat> replicate that. So uh, I started uh, started working with um, uh, Kate and talking about some of our goals and what we uh, wanted to do and uh, virtually turned it into just a mass uh, science experiment of trying to see what, what works and what didn't work. But uh, I really loved the diversity aspect and what I saw that did for our performance and uh, knowing and, and, and researching and uh, being able to enhance the biological activity of the ground of our land and all that. We, uh, we went to some diverse uh, mixes and uh, the one on the right uh, side of this, this picture, as you can see in the this description is uh, the barley, peas, oats, and triticale. And uh, we harvested some as, um, uh, some as forage and uh, we grazed a little bit. And we also uh, harvested a little bit as grain. Uh, we had an absolute, uh, uh, just a monsoon of a summer. This was last year. And uh, we, we weren't actually able to harvest some of it for grain because we couldn't get, uh, we actually couldn't, we had a hard time getting the combines on the field. Um, our goal is uh, very little tillage to no till. Um, but unfortunately where we started, we had to, we had to uh, terminate some long, long-term sod and it happened to be on some clay ground. So <clears throat> that was a, a little tough, but a, but a learning curve. But nevertheless, uh, it grew very well, matured very well, and we were happy with it. Uh, uh, on the left uh, is our warm season grazing mix. And uh, this is actually uh, on a field that uh, was a little further from the farm, but we wanted to just see, we wanted to see, I wanted to be able to, to uh, just, monitor it through different stages of maturity and see how it did. But uh, it's just really amazing uh, to see all these species working and thriving together. Um, it's, it's, it's simply just amazing. And one thing as, as farm folks, as uh, that we do is we always seem to be on the run, on the run, on the run, on the run. And uh, there's a few other leaders in the, uh, the regenerative ag movement uh, that'll that uh, I'm just uh, you know voicing what I've heard them say and and it's observation so we try to take uh, more time now to just look and see you know how these how these mixes are doing on a on a, on a hot day on a cooler day on a when it's wet when it's dry and uh, and be able to to make um, you know, make future decisions, you know, based on how that's growing. Um, and the other point I want to add is I think we're going to have more of a, a need for this, um, for these grazing mixes for our, our cattle, because uh, we seem with our shifting in weather patterns and such, um, we have become extremely hot and humid here in the Northeast with, without the uh, normal uh, breaks uh, that traditionally we used to have. Uh, years ago and, and, and all that. So I think our cool season grasses are actually uh, trying to figure out uh, how to, how to perform. Uh, and we usually you know, look through that for that summer slump, as they say, uh, with our cool season grasses, but more so than ever, um, I think we're going to need to interject uh, some of these grazing mixes. Uh, also this year, we experimented with uh, uh, grazing really tight, uh, with our milking cows on a, on a field. And then we no tilled in a very similar mix uh, with this. So that's up and growing uh, right now. Um, it's definitely not the easiest thing to do to uh, no till into a, a standing sod piece, but uh, these, 
these varieties seem to be pretty resilient and uh, seem to be uh, fighting through the, the sod base and, and coming up and, uh, and, and looking pretty good. So uh, this year, I hopefully have more pictures of those. So maybe on to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a later uh, picture of uh, that same mix with the, the peas, barley, triticale, and oats. And again, you can you can see uh, everything. Uh, you can almost pick out every species there. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised on how uniform uh, the stand was. And uh, again, being uh, being organic, uh, basically all we all we have for for fertilizer inputs is whatever comes out of the back end of the cow or whatever we can spread on the fields of our of our own manure. Um, but when, uh, we've, we've definitely seen when you, when you add the diversity, uh, how much you can make up for, um, those lack of lack of inputs, which is, which is a good thing. I mean, that's our, that's our goal. We don't want to have to spend the money on that. So, uh, under the next, uh, this was a, a field, uh, of, uh, sorghum sedan and forage beans. Um, and we're still trying to, uh, and now that we're actually getting uh, good, uh, good yields and, and good establishments, we're just trying to figure out uh, what's the most cost effective for, uh, for what we want to plant, how we can harvest it. Um, <clears throat> this here, we, uh, we swathed and, and chopped, um, but uh, it's uh, the sorghum sedan grass grows, can grow very, very well. It seems to, for us, smother out any, uh, weeds if we if we have a field that has some weed pressure um, we did again this we did lightly uh, lightly till um, to get established and then hopefully we won't have to till it for a long long time again or ever again um, and then we followed this up uh, nice thing about these summer uh, forages summer annuals uh, we can we can get a, a pretty early diverse cover crop on so we we're able to uh to drill in a cover crop, uh, then we that provide us some uh, some spring forage. It was a, a triticale uh, blend uh, with some crimson clover and a couple other things. All right, on to the next one. I think it's going to be a close up. Yeah, so this was uh, this was at an earlier stage. You can see the the beans uh, in the sorghum sedan and. Uh, you still see a little bit of the grass um, that we were kind of fighting uh, through because it was probably 15 to 20 years of, of sod base that we were trying to establish some of these, uh, some of these summer crops through, but once, uh, once it got up and going, it, it really took over and suppressed the grass. So it uh, ended up being a very nice crop. So, um, all right, what's next on the slide? Oh, this is a, a little more mature. You can see the buckwheat popped up through and oh, all the, everything in there. Um, but you just see, uh, What's amazing about at this stage, you see uh, the pollinators, uh, you see the bees and the butterflies and all the insects. Um, this, I wish, uh, I wish I'd taken a video because to stand in this uh, midsummer, late summer in this stand, it just all the activity uh, above ground, let alone what what the biological activity was doing below the ground. But um, <clears throat> pretty amazing. The cows, um, the cows really enjoyed uh, grazing this also and uh we definitely saw a little bump in in milk production um and performance when we uh when we came through this stand so next slide uh so then our next goal um for wintertime feed was uh, we were trying to uh, establish a crop that we could direct chop um so we didn't have to swath it and didn't have to harvest it uh, multiple times because uh, as most of you that harvest haylage know, um, or hay crop that's, you know, going around for uh, what I would call average yields uh, for hay crop in an organic uh, farming system is is questionable on uh, on uh, if it's uh, feasible or not long term. So we're trying to de decrease uh, the number of, of silage uh, hay 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 crop acres and do more of these um, summer annual crops. And, uh, you know, our goal is if we can put it through a grain drill, um, it's a little easier for us. We haven't gotten into cultivating or anything like that, um, more so for just time constraints and busy summers and 
and uh, trying to keep everything else flowing. So uh, this is a, a forage sorghum mixture um, with some other diversity underneath it. I believe we had a couple brassicas in there and flat uh, and some other things. So this uh, this grew uh, this grew very well and we were able to take a pretty good crop off it. Uh, unfortunately, we had uh, we actually had a tornado come through right next to us uh, this past September, this last September. Uh, which we're not known for uh, in our neck of the woods for for that kind of act, weather activity, and uh, a lot of it was was flattened. But um, uh, surprisingly, most of it popped back up, so we, we were able to to get uh, a lot of it uh, harvested. So, uh, so yeah, so that's our. Uh, I don't know if there's any more slides, Kate, or that's. Oh, there's a little closer view. Um, and again, what we're you know we're trying to we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, whatever we drill is to, to get good coverage and, and body armor on the soil. Um, and we're, we're starting to, uh, to just uh, analyze all that. And, and if we can, uh, if we can keep the ground cool and protected um, and, uh, you know, have these different species working symbiotically together uh, to, uh, to thrive, um, that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, so far pretty successful on that. Um, and we're going to try to keep doing more of it and probably add even more diversity as we, uh, as we progress on other slide or is that the last one? Oh yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that's our, you know, that's our overview of the, of the farm and, uh, be happy to, uh, uh answer any questions if I, if I went uh, too fast or skipped through anything or, Anything anybody wants to elaborate on more than more than happy to do so. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that, Eric. Um, we do have some questions coming in and just a reminder to everybody, uh, feel free to drop any questions you have in the Q&A box um, and we will get to those when we can. Um, I, I have a couple follow-up questions just to get started with. Um, I guess, first of all, though, um, I love how you were asking the question, just because we can, does it mean that we should? Um, I think no matter what industry you're in, that's an important question to be asking, because um, there are a lot of things that we can do with all the things that we know in science and, and all of this. But it is, yeah, really important to, <laughs> to be asking that question all the time, um, just because it's available to us doesn't mean it's necessarily um, great for us. We could go eat McDonald's every day, but that's not <laughs> a great option. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'm kind of curious where, where did you originally find out about grazing or what kind of started that whole journey that kind of turned you, um, it, it, quote, like bit by the grazing bug, uh, where was that seed planted? Well, I, I, uh, I definitely, uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't like about uh, going to work on, on my family's operation that I've been a part part of, of my you know my whole life and um, I grew up there was no question I wanted to farm um, there's no question I wanted to go to to college and and you know further my education and um, I, I I reached a point where my back was sore my feet were sore and I was on concrete all day long. Um, and I just said, oh, well, if I don't want to be on concrete all day long and I'm and I'm not, you know, I'm not here to bash. There's a there's a there's a ton of conventional folks that do a super job with cow care and and, uh, you know, and all that. So I'm not here to 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 down that one bit. I just I'm just sharing my personal beliefs and, and thoughts. And and I said, you know what? I don't want to be on concrete all the time. Why do they want to be on concrete all the time? And we had sand better freestyle barns and high production and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was in its own right. It was successful. It just wasn't the way I wanted to be successful myself. So um, I, I remember as a, as a kid that uh, I had, uh, we had a Holstein cattle and I had my, my token three or four Jersey cows as a, as a young 4 h -er And um I got sick of hauling them. I think I was 10 or 11 years old and uh, I got sick of hauling them hay and water. And I started putting up portable fence then. And I think I had them pretty close to my, 
my parents uh, front porch after a while. So I guess I had it just ingrained in me and I kind of remembered back to that and how much, how much fun that was. And, and, uh, and so, geez, uh, you know, we used to, we used to move the cows out all the time at that stage and went to one grazing school um, that was local and uh, was geared a little more towards uh, finishing beef cattle. Uh, okay. but obviously as people know, if you can finish beef cattle, uh, same type of energy requirements as, as dairy cattle. So it just, it just clicked. And, and, uh, once I started doing it, uh, I was just, I knew I was, that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So you talked about improving your pastures, the, the native cool season pastures. Well, they were orchard grass pastures. Um, but slowly you've been able to kind of revamp those pastures. And you mentioned being able to do that with the rotational grazing. So just for a clarification, you did not reseed anything, any of those new or the native, I guess they were always there. No. And it was, uh, and that's probably what I'm most amazed about as far as our, uh, pat, our original pastures is I didn't think that was quite as it is possible that would, that would happen quite as quickly. And, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of seed out there. Um, of course I shouldn't be saying this on the seed company, but, uh, Hey, everybody, everybody knows green covers in this business for the, for the right reason. So I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to defend them, but, uh, as a company, but there's so much seed out there. It just has to be activated in the biological activity. And then even if you're going to drill in seed, you have to, even for that to be effective, you have to have the right biological activity working. You have to have those earthworms working. You have to be covered. You can't be overgrazing. So all that comes into, uh, comes into play. But we just simply, uh, being a startup, and we bit off a big capital investment in facilities and everything else on startup, it was just, it had just been the, the, the can had been kicked down the road. And I said, well, maybe next year, maybe next year. But as year two and three and four, there just became no need, or I felt no need to, uh, to have to do that. And it's really, uh, it's really just putting all the, all the basic principles together of, of stock density and moving quickly and skipping over a spot observation, using that observation. If we need to re restore a part of a pasture, um, you know, we put some bales out in spots that had some multi-floor rows and, uh, you know, it, it, towards the end of the grazing season or towards fall, early winter. And it looks like these cattle are going to decimate the area, which they do for a short period of time. But then, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a great way to, to revamp, uh, some of the soil, the soil with that, um, minimal disturbance and, uh, boy, it just pays back so fast. And in the moment, it seems like maybe you need, you think you need that sector of land, but just giving it the extra rest, it, for instance, that it needs, or if you do overgraze by accident, just the rest, you know, um, integrating that into your system or your plan uh, seems to pay back tenfold the next year. Yeah. Yeah. So you hosted a field day with Understanding Ag last fall. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Were you doing any uh, like species analysis, whether it was for plants or like the bird species, uh, any sort of soil health testing around the property or even uh, tests for the animal herd, like uh, milk production levels, fat content, all of that kind of stuff? So, so that's, yeah, great questions in there. So yeah, we, we uh, were very fortunate to be able to host a <clears throat> soil health academy. Um, I had attended one prior to that and to have people out on our farm was just, it was awesome. And, uh, the folks, you know, the folks from understanding ag, uh, um, yeah. So I, I was surprised, like, I thought we had six, seven, eight different species in our pasture, but, uh, those folks being way better at identifying, uh, I mean, it was, it was endless. It was over 20 different species. That was, oh, wow. it was yeah. crazy. Um, and then, and just, you know, all the classes, all the classes were represented and, and it's, uh, yeah, it was just, it was really surprising to me that, uh, that, uh, you know, that could happen. And then they were very complimentary 
uh, one of the consultants had been out to the farm a few years back and uh, couldn't believe the progress we had made uh, just in the two years or a year and a half since he had been there. So uh, that was that was pretty gratifying and reassuring that you're doing the, the right things because you could take a snapshot of today and think, oh, my goodness, we, we really messed that up or we overgrazed or we didn't graze quick enough or uh, back and forth. But uh, having that, you know, taking the bigger stepping back and looking at the bigger picture, um, you know, it was it was really good. So uh, we are uh, actually I got to tip my hat to, to Stonyfield, uh, our our milk company, yogurt, yogurt company, where we sell our milk. Uh, we're a part of an open team program with them. Uh, and they are helping us measure uh, carbon levels at different um, inches in the soil, uh, soil organic matter, and a few other things, and uh, starting a benchmark with their other direct supply farms. And uh, so as we go down the road, we're going to have some, there's some measurability and uh, there's some progress tracking there. Uh, that we'll have some reports on. So we've, we've just, we've just started that uh, a few years ago. So, um, and as everybody knows, it, uh, it takes a little while to, to move, to move those levels, but uh, that's what we're definitely focusing on now. And we can, we can measure it and, and uh, you know, then help try to manage that better. Yeah, for sure. So that can kind of launch us into uh, some of the um, attendee questions that we've got. So, Evan asked, why haven't you gotten into the grass milk market? So while we're on the topic of uh, where you're selling your milk to, kind of just give us an overview of why you chose to go with Stonyfield and kind of the process to become organic or why you chose to go that route. And then, yeah, Evan's question, why not the grass milk market specifically? Uh, great question. So um, when I when I first uh, moved over in 2018 from the other operation, I was definitely, I, I was still very conventional minded, even though I was grazing and starting to move that direction. I wasn't uh, anywhere near where I'm at today as far as the grass, uh, the grass fed uh, straight market was, was really not even on the radar. Um, but as we've moved uh as we progressed each year um that's definitely on my mind and uh we have gone from feeding you know 18 to 20 pounds of grain a day when we first started uh, and trying to mask a lot of our imperfections i think on on that uh you know now we're we're down to you know eight to ten in the summer so we have cut that almost in half a little more in the winter time but it is on the radar um and we're starting to, uh, yeah, we're starting to take a look at that, but it's definitely an option. Um, we don't have a lot of options in my neck of the woods. Um, there's a, there's a, a little more of a cohort of, of grass fed producers in central and Western New York, Pennsylvania. Um, there, I mean, I could, I could explore some markets there too. Um, and may look into that, but, uh, so that, yeah, that's definitely, definitely on the radar. And as we, as we get better with our grazing, that makes that more of a viable option. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Burke is asking, what is the, what breed of cow are you using? And it looks like there's a little bit of a conglomerate. So what, what's in there? So I can't decide what I like. So I have okay. everything. We <laughs> no. So we're Jersey, we're Jersey based. Um, and uh we had, we started with some conventional, uh, higher productive life, life type Holsteins that we pulled out mm -hmm. of my family's operation when I first made the transition. Um, and a lot of those cows are still around, but a lot of, a lot of Jersey. And, uh, we've actually started incorporating some, uh, some Ayrshire back in and they're milking some crosses. So, uh, haven't, haven't found the perfect cow yet, but we're definitely, uh, we're definitely trying to stop, stay with that smaller framed um, Jersey type type cow that we're, we're pretty happy with. Yeah. Well, there again, even for the cows, there's, there's beauty and diversity <laughs> above ground yeah. too. So yeah. that's awesome. Uh, Burke is also asking how and what do you feed in the winter? Gotcha. So uh, we actually, um, we are feeding just haylage, uh, chopped haylage, some baleage, uh, and then we keep it real simple. We feed a cornmeal, uh, steam flake corn mixture, 
and then uh, just a protein mix with minerals. And but the protein basically only consists of roasted soy and and soy meal. So uh, winter time, it's usually nine to ten pounds of cornmeal and three to four pounds of protein is where we're at, and that maintains an average, you know, herd average days of milk about 165 to 70 during the winter time. Um, high forties to, to close to 50 pounds of, uh, of milk production per day per cow, uh, components. Our goal is always 5% fat, but we're about four, eight, four, 9% fat as we still have some Holsteins and crosses in there. And, uh, three, you know, three, three to three, four protein okay. is where we average on that for our components. Um, and that's, you know, that's definitely the name of the game. Um, and I did want to add, I think I might have skipped over it, but uh, this year um, was one of the first years we didn't see what's deemed as that seasonal depression in um, in butterfat as much in protein. Okay. So we're starting to analyze and we're really not, we're not, our feed inputs aren't much different than just our pastures keep evolving. So that's, uh, that's, that's been a nice, that's been a nice surprise, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So then Ryan is also asking, are you able to graze anything during the winter? So are you out rotating the cows or anything? So the milk herd, the, our, our grazing season, we're out, we're out end of, end of April, early May at the latest. And we usually graze, I would call very successfully, uh, quantity wise, right through the, the end of October, a couple of days in November. Um, in the past few years, we've been keeping, uh, so that's the milk herd. And then they're usually back in the barn. Uh, this year, one of our goals was to stockpile a little more feed um, because we've been able to take our dry stock and heifers because we've been seasonably, seasonally warm into Christmas time. And the first of the year, uh, we've been able to take them almost to that time frame if we have enough stockpiled forage. So that's, and again, the need for less stored feed and eliminating that cost of harvest. Uh, yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely getting there. And we're actually looking at um, uh, renting more pasture type ground so that we could uh, export uh, some of the young stock during the summer in, or late summer, midsummer, late summer, in order to extend that stockpile and grazing season that would take us into the early winter. So, okay, yeah. Now, earlier in the uh, presentation, you mentioned you mentioned the solar panel uh, project that you guys were kind of doing. Uh, what other new projects, or you could explain that a little bit. Um, but what other new projects do you have going for either this season or the upcoming maybe twenty twenty five? Yeah, so that was uh, you know the, the solar project was. Um, was one of our goals and USDA had a, uh, a, a nice, a nice grant in order to make that possible. So we were able to, to receive that and, uh, and, uh, get some good funding for that. Um, we just fired that up. So haven't, uh, haven't received our first bill with, uh, with the solar panels on yet. So okay. we'll see, but it should take care of, uh, it's set up for a, you know, maximum 110% of our usage. And unfortunately it doesn't, uh, our state doesn't pay anything back or virtually anything back for if we produce more. So it's, it, it's main goal is to just, you know, ease the burden of our electricity bills. And you're figuring that uh, energy costs aren't ever going to soften They're over time. They're just going to, you know, keep elevating and increasing. So hopefully that just puts us at a, at a stopping point for, for all of that. Um, other things, uh, you know, we're just, uh, we're just figuring out how to utilize our, uh, our waste a little better our manure and, uh, irrigation has always been on my mind, even though I said we were, uh, flooding. So we're looking at, uh, possibly, uh, digging and trying to capture some, some runoff water and, um, and store that and be able to, to irrigate some pastures if, if, and when we have a, a drought season. Um, because as we, you know, as everybody knows, it was, a, it was amazing last year. We had, we had a lot of rainfall, um, tons of rainfall. It was basically like natural irrigation. It was almost hard getting, even though our laneways are, are pretty solid. It was actually hard getting the cattle 
onto the pad, just, just off the main lane. Once they're onto the pastures with everything, uh, with all our, our infiltration, good infiltration in the pastures and good grazing coverage. And, uh, you know, we were able to take that rainwater and utilize all of it, but, uh, in just spots where you had mass, uh, uh, you know, congregation where they're coming off the lanes all at once and on the lanes, it was, it was crazy. But, uh, but anyway, we grew a just a tremendous amount of forage. And, and of course that uh, if we do the, you know, multiplication of that, we could uh, increase the carrying capacity of a farm <clears throat> if we had some irrigation possibilities. Yeah, for sure. That's interesting. You bring that up. Uh, one of the summers that I was in college, I worked for a farmer and we traveled around and and went and saw other farms as well. And they talked a lot about, and this was in kind of the driftless region of Wisconsin and Iowa, Southern Minnesota. And we talked a lot about these little, this natural irrigation system that happened every morning with the dew. Hmm. Um, Cause there's so much dew on the ground and the plants are still able to utilize that. So, and I would imagine in your region, kind of similar, uh, some similar rainfall, probably somewhat similar humidity levels too. Um, I'm sure you guys get a lot of dew every morning, but those cool season grasses just love to love that environment. Definitely. Definitely. And I think, uh, uh, so I, I spent a summer in California on an internship on a couple dairies out there and that was 1997 and you know water was a huge topic and I yeah. you know at that age and uh, it's thinking oh we won't ever have to worry about water in the northeast and uh, but we have we've seen some summers that were really really dry so and that's a good thing about you know using the good grazing principles and and even the cropping strategies with the diversity and coverage and I think we can you know folks that are following this system and wanting to learn more and impl implement this system, it's it's going to safeguard us longer than the average neighbor that's that's not. So I think water has to be and will be more to the forefront than I, I ever thought uh, back 15, 10 years ago, even. So right. it's definitely yeah. Freedom. yeah. And I would say a lot of people in this Regenerative ag space would argue that the water cycle is probably one of the most important things that we need to be focused on no matter where you are, whether you're getting 42 inches of rain a year or five inches of rain a year. It's all, all about the water cycle. Definitely. We've got another question coming in from Taryn. He asks, do you have an opinion concerning A2? Uh, does it play a role in your operation? when you're kind of making man management decisions, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think, uh, I think A2, A2 is, uh, you know, when I first, when I first learned about it years ago, it was very intriguing. So <clears throat> at that point um, I was still on uh, my conventional dairy and we actually, we had a, a herd of 50, we milked 1200 cows, but had a herd of 50, 60 jerseys within that herd. So we started using, or I started using all A2 bulls at that time. Um, and a lot of those, uh, offspring out of those cattle were the ones I was able to transition my one-time transition into organic. Uh, so I was able to start with a lot of, uh, cattle that have been bred A2. I haven't gone through and tested the whole herd, but I definitely, I like it. I think there's something to it. Um, I've talked to a lot of, a lot of consumers, meaning, uh, friends of friends and, uh, folks like that, that, uh, um, you know, had struggled with what they thought was lactose intolerance. And, uh, I, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of, for me, it's no brainer. So we, we still continue to use our AI bulls or A2, A2, um, because there's plenty of, there's plenty of bulls out there, or I think good bulls out there of any breed that are A2, A2 now. So I think it's, I think there's something to it. And I think it's something that can only help, uh, our industry is when it comes to marketing and, and, uh, utilization of, of any dairy product. Yeah. So you mentioned being in conversation with consumers, how has that changed or evolved since, uh, when you were in conventional dairy, uh, to now being in organic, um, are you in conversation with more consumers or how has that conversation shifted? Yeah. So I actually, um, Again, I'm uh, very fortunate to have worked with uh, Stonyfield, our 
milk company and uh, have done quite a few uh, meetings with them. Um, I was able to meet with some dietitians from a, a large grocery store chain um, to having people out on the farm that are responsible for buying and stocking, the, you know, keeping the shelves full of a certain organic dairy product or yogurt. Um, so that's really opened my eyes to what people, what certain, uh, what certain demographics of people want and are looking for and the questions they ask. And um, one of them, uh, one of it, and sometimes it gets in the, a lot of it gets in the organic versus conventional um, or grazing and, and not and, and that kind of thing. But uh, a lot of them ask, a lot of them ask about the, the age of the cattle and how long they live. Um, a lot of them ask about, are aware of the A2. Um, so there are, I think a lot of uh, consumers are aware of that. So yeah, we have to, and no matter where you're selling your milk, um, we have to, uh, you know, bring that, bring all the positives, not that we want to hide the negatives, but bring as many positive attributes of grazing and, and for me, regenerative organic to the forefront and, uh, and let them know why that's, why that's enhancing the product that they're purchasing yeah. for them or for the kids or, um, yeah. So, uh, we actually, uh, want to continue to host, uh, different groups of, of folks out at our farm, uh, in order to do that, whether it's influencers or, um, you know, moms that are moms or dads that are buying, uh, yogurt for their two-year-old or their 18-year-old or themselves at 45 years old or 50, you know, so we want to be able to, we, but I think that's the good thing about our system is we can cover all the bases and make people feel good about what they're consuming, show them our farm, show them our goals, show them where we were, where we're at now, where we want to be and uh, incorporate all that into uh, the marketing end because we have to be our own in, you know, there's probably immense marketing budgets for large companies, whether they're selling uh, beef or pork or uh, lumber or milk or dairy, any dairy product. But we have to, I believe we all have to, to aid in that to, because everybody wants to hear it. Most everybody appreciates hearing uh, the, the, the message and the vision from directly from the producer farmer themselves. Right. Yeah. And that's such a powerful story to share. Um, and you've done a great job sharing that today. So, um, yeah, it's it's really important that we connect with the consumers um, and share our side of the story and um, make sure that they know like the full picture and everything that's going into that. So we're getting close to ending here. Uh, if anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, but I always like to kind of end with a more big picture question. Um, so what is most exciting to you about the regenerative ag movement and, and where do you see this going in the future? And um, I guess, how do you see yourself uh, playing a role in that uh, movement as a whole? So what's, what's most energizing uh, to me is to see um, the, the, the quantity and the quality and the density of what we're producing. So I, I heard a lot of times about, well, we may not be able to, to feed the world this way or produce the, the amount of crops, you know, this way with these practices. And it's, it's quite the opposite. I just, I am so, um, just pleasantly surprised and, and enthusiastic about, the response when you start putting these principles together, how that, how it, the multiplier effect of it. And I thought it would be much slower. So that's energizing and it's energizing to see how everybody is like helping each other and working together. There's not, I don't think there's one producer anywhere that isn't willing to share what they know uh, and what they did wrong, what they did right. Uh, or try to help. Well, why? I wonder why that didn't work for you, but it worked for me here. Or so that's really energizing. I think uh, the ag community has always been um, an awesome 
there's always been an awesome network and cohesiveness to most everybody in the ag industry is, uh, uh, and just seeing, seeing people come together from companies like yourselves to the producers, to everybody in between. Uh, for me, that's energizing because as we all know, as producers and farmers, sometimes when this breaks and that breaks, the snowball hits and, and you can get, you know, the negativity can, can start to crush you. But when you have a strong network of, of people to rely on and, and work around, it's, it's, you can overcome that in, in a short period of time. So. Yeah. Awesome. And that has definitely been proven in your, your pastures and the, the land, it sounds like. So that's great to see that on a um, personal side too, uh, to see that in the human interactions as, as well. So awesome. Well, uh, there are no more questions in the Q&A box. So I think we'll probably wrap up here. Thanks again, Eric, so much for sharing your story. And thank you all for joining the webinar today. And we'll see you next week at 12 o'clock. Um, sorry, no, we're taking a break next week. <laughs> um for happy independence day early it'll be july 3rd next wednesday um but we will be back um that following week that would be july let's see july 10th um we'll be back and we'll have kevin wiltsey on for our speaker so join us all for that and thanks again eric thanks everybody